Let's get started. Hi. Welcome. Uh, I'm James Coven, one of the chief residents here with the Terms of Training Program. It's really wonderful to see you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for making the move from our other location. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Ruby Leica is an, an adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist, also an assistant research scientist at the UCLA Center for Health Services and Society. Uh, originally from Texas, Dr. Leica graduated from Harvard Medical School, did her adult psychiatry training at the University of Colorado, spent three years with um, partners in health working in rural Haiti and Peru, um, and then recently completed her child and adolescent psychiatry training at UCLA. Dr. Leica has participated in many, many projects, um, from depression interventions for youth in Uganda, a suicide intervention for LGBT youth involved in the justice system. She's the inaugural course director of UCLA's Racism and Psychiatry Curriculum. And meanwhile, she's been recognized numerous, numerous times in many different settings, including multiple awards through UCLA and their division of psychiatry, a Lachlan Award, a um, fellowship, excuse me, to the American College of Physicians and Perkins Leadership Fellowship through the American Psychiatric Association. We are so honored to have Dr. Leica <laughs> here today to talk about this incredibly important and incredibly necessary subject. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Leica. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I'm honored to be here today to take on a subject that rarely receives adequate attention in our profession. So usually I present this material as part of a series or four or five lectures, so there's a lot more time to establish the frame, which is vitally important for any meaningful racial dialogue. Um, we do have a limited amount of time today, so I'll keep it brief, but the things that I do want to say is that this material can be very difficult and it often provokes strong emotional reactions from people, um, guilt, anger, frustration are some of them. My goal for today is to join with you all and to try to provoke questioning and inquiry and to walk out of the door, walk out the door thinking, what can I do next? Not to have all of the answers. It's actually uh, impossible to establish the legacy of slavery in American medicine and psychiatry in 60 minutes or probably in 60 years. But if we can at least start, then we've made progress today. Um, I also wanna emphasize that the terms that I'm going to be using are racist themselves and problematic, and I just want to acknowledge that as I start. So in terms of disclosures and conflicts of interest, there are none that are financial, but it's also incredibly important to situate oneself in terms of axes of privilege and power. The diagram on the right, I know it's a little bit hard to make out, but if you Google privilege, uh, or axes of privilege, that kind of thing, you'll find something like this. And I included it as a way to acknowledge that as a woman of color and the skin that I am in, I have one foot rooted in the world of white supremacy and have benefited from that. But I also have a window into the experience of discrimination as well. Um, there are so many other axes of power and privilege that have allowed me to even have this forum today to speak to you. And I just wanted to be really clear about this. Um, I also listed the names of the other uh, lectures that I give as a part of this series so you can sort of understand how it's framed. Uh, and last, I wanted to say that a lot of the content is taken from a book chapter that I helped write with some other colleagues in a book called Racism and Psychiatry, Contemporary Issues and Interventions. So why is this topic important in the first place? So, there are a number of reasons captured here. It's a little hard to see on the left, but that's a National Academy of Medicine document called Framing the Dialogue on Racial and Ethnic, sorry, <laughs> on Racial Ethnicity for Advanced, sorry, on Racial and Race and Ethnicity for Advancing Health Equity. I apologize for that. Um, and it really sort of makes the case that a strong historical foundation is vitally important for understanding disparities and thinking about ways of dismantling them. Uh, the other piece that I wanted to emphasize is that even though we have made progress with some health disparities, there are many that have endured 
a couple of the most striking ones are the disproportionately high rate of African-American maternal mortality, which is three to four times higher than it is for white mothers. The other is the higher death rate uh, among uh, black African-American people in our country across almost all uh, stages of life. Um, there also have been numerous other health reports showing that even though there's some improvement on a number of quality indicators on a number of others, there is an improvement or things have in fact gotten worse. So that's one piece. The other piece is that we find ourselves in this era of medical students in particular and trainees also demanding more from our, our health curricula, something that goes beyond um, uh, implicit bias and cultural competency, which is usually the lens through which racism is taught. We'll come back to this racial justice report card that was put out by the student organization group, White Coat for Black Lives. But you, one of the criteria that they used in this report, report card, which is a, a measure of different medical schools grading them on their um, the extent to which racial, racial justice is worked into the medical school, one of the uh, components is actually an anti-racist curriculum. So there's really a dearth of educational materials to guide this and to meet this need. So the hope is for this lecture to take a very small step in trying to address this gap. The images on this slide speak to so many things. They speak to racism in America and racism and slavery are intimately intertwined in this country. They also emphasize the way in which the past lives in the present. So one really cannot make sense of or under, understand Trayvon Martin without thinking first about Emmett Till and so many others. And the events that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia a couple of years ago, um, that sort of racial violence has to be understood in the context of what happened in Watts, California in 1965 and many other events. The other piece that I wanna emphasize is that this dialogue of slavery and what to do about it is emerging in our country, which is uh, very powerful. So reparations is now becoming um, an aspect of the 2019 presidential election. And recently, students at Georgetown voted in support of enacting a tuition hike to um, address reparations paid towards descendants of people who were enslaved who helped participate in the building of the university. So our topic today is really timely. Just to worry about methodology, um, much of what I'll be talking about today is drawn from disciplines outside of the scientific literature. Um, the social sciences, journalism, uh, nonprofit and, and advocacy groups. There's lots of photos and images to guard against intellectualizing this topic and to make it human and real. Um, you'll notice in the background a photo uh, taken from Governor Ralph Northam's medical, years, medical yearbook um, from 1984, and we'll come back to this later on. So, Understanding slavery's centrality to our social, economic, and political institutions is the key to excavating its role in shaping medicine and psychiatry. So to start, we're going to take a little bit of time doing a brief but hopefully meaningful deep dive into understanding the legacy of slavery in our country. Once we do that, we'll take a look at its legacy within the profession. And then at the end, we'll close trying to take this consideration of the past to imagine what a more just future would look like. My hope is that we'll have some time to have a conversation about it because it's really the dialogue that's going to shape the next steps that happen. This is a 1788 description of a slave ship. It's a very famous schematic of how to strategically pack hundreds of human beings and to reduce them to human cargo taking up 16 inches each start to think about the ideologies of dehumanization and denigration needed. Uh, these are the apparatuses of justification used to enforce racist policies. Wise words from MacArthur Genius Fellow, Taneezy Coates, one of the leading scholars in the field of race and racism, to inspire us to not be patriots a la carte. So we'll start with the transatlantic slave trade, which really started to emerge and develop 
in about the 17th century. The term transatlantic slave trade itself is a misnomer. It betrays the industrialization, the industrialized human trafficking of 12 to 15 million human beings from Africa to the Western Hemisphere from the middle of the middle of the 15th century to the turn of the 20th century. Nobody knows how many millions of people died in this process. The size of the arrows on the map denote the quantity of people who were actually transported. And what might be surprising is that the arrow to the United States, relatively speaking, is actually quite small compared to, say, Brazil. So slavery in terms of the number of enslaved human beings starts to really pick up at the turn of the 19th century. That's when the international slave trade uh, officially closes, although not in practice. And then at that point, the domestic slave trade emerges. Um, the horrors of the middle passage from the transatlantic slave trade are often described in the schematic of the slave ship that I showed is meant to draw attention to that, what the experience of being transported in this way was like. Historian Henry Louis Gates has talked about the domestic slave trade being a second middle passage rife with its own horrors. The diagram on the left um, really captures this rise in the number of enslaved people. It's very tied to the 1793 invention of the cotton gin, which enhanced the productivity of enslaved people astronomically. Um, one historian said that the surge of profits from the cotton industry seemed to lead to an it led to a seemingly insatiable demand for enslaved people, and so the numbers surge, and we have to start to think about how the numbers surged as well. So just to give an idea of how massive this enterprise is, on the eve of the Civil War in 1861, 61% of American exports are cotton and picked by nearly 4 million enslaved people. The diagram on the right highlights the major regional movements characterizing the domestic slave trade which includes New York, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia. I think a lot of times people think that slavery is an institution of the South. That's, that's actually not true. So Edward Baptist is a historian who's written an excellent book um, called this Half is, The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism, and he emphasizes a couple of things. Um, number one, the centrality of the interstate trade enslaves to the regional and national economy, and number two, the extreme violence involved. So this is not a footnote to U.S. history, nor is it sort of a dying enterprise. It's a highly organized economic engine. It's a savagely brutal process. It's also, as I was saying, not just a southern institution. So northern industries provide and develop the banks, credit systems, boats, whips and chains to drive the process. They also have the cotton textile industry that develops um, and profits from these ill-gotten rewards. The millions in dollars that are generated from this form the endowments for some of our country's top universities, which are slowly starting to face their own reckoning uh, process related to their involvement with slavery. So Princeton, Harvard, and Yale are just some of the examples. Also, these academic institutions become breeding grounds for developing the racist ideologies that are needed to sustain the policies in the first place. So this is really tough to sit with, but essentially we have a labor system based on nothing less than torture and systematic exploitation underpinning our wealth and power, um, which goes so counter to the ideals of democracy and freedom. So this slide is meant to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence and family separation are a massive component of this enterprise. So when I was commenting on the surge in the number of bodies, one has to think about logically where, where this came from. And so we know as psychiatrists what sexual violence means and what family separation means. Um, I actually included the statement issued by the National Academies of Medicine and Science issued um, during the family separation at the border. 
what's remarkable is that nobody's ever talked about family separation that has characterized this country for so many centuries beforehand through slavery and also in the American Indian Alaska Native communities. I also want to share a story um, from one historian named Heather Andrea Williams, um, who used, she's a historian who used primary documents to reconstruct the devastating moments in which people who were enslaved were torn apart from one another, and then also to trace their efforts to find each other after slavery ends. She uses this by finding wanted ads in local newspapers. She actually quotes a woman named Delia Garlic, who recalls the family separations, separations devastated, sorry, the families separated by slavery. Oops, sorry. So Ms. Garlic says, Babes were snatched from, the pre from their brothers' breasts and sold as speculators. Children were separated from sisters and brothers and never saw each other again. Of course, they cried. You'd think that they didn't cry when they were sold like cattle. Dr. Williams informs us that based on her research, about a third of children in the Upper South endured family separation. She describes how some people embraced the, oh, sorry, embraced the fiction that Sorry. I just want to be able to see my text. Sorry about that. Let's use this here. Okay. Um, she said some people, some white people embrace the fiction that black people lack the capacity to feel emotions or to experience these sorrows. She also says other people just pretended that it wasn't happening. One would think that this is very, one doesn't have to think, this is very germane to our profession and the work that we do, but again, this is not something that we talk about. So we've talked a little bit about slavery. How do we start to think about what its legacy is in America? Um, this is a quote from the Southern Poverty Law Center, one of a number of advocacy groups that I'll be talking about here. Um, the diagram on the left is meant to draw attention to the timeline. And so we can see slavery starts in the early part of the 17th century. One can start to imagine that it's alive and well developing and developed when our American institutions start to arise. So the Constitution is written and drafted in the late 18th century. This is already in place. American medicine takes form in largely through the 19th century. So our institutions are constructed upon it. In short, the point that I'll try to make very briefly over the next couple of slides is that the legacy of slavery really is the enduring human rights violations perpetrated against black people, families, and communities. The government sanctioned violence and terrorism to maintain racial order a reinforcing ideology of racial difference, one specifically based on white supremacy and black inferiority, and finally, a denial and failure to atone for and take responsibility for the wrongs committed. So what I just said is, it's so much to say, and it's a very painful history to sit with, but a vitally important one to sit with. So thinking about the legacy of slavery in our country, it's 250 years of policy decisions designed to, per, to preserve racial inequality. So racial inequity, we often will think of it as being exercised through individual actions or people doing ignorant things. But so many social scientists will describe how it's actually, or how it is also powerfully exercised in the halls of power and influence. And it's not solely in the in individual interactions. Every reference that I have up here, it's, um, I mean, this is multiple, multiple dissertations in one, so it's hard to distill it down to one slide, but I, I will draw attention to a couple of examples of the structural racism that continues to exist as a result of slavery. Um, you can see on the left, it's an image of a map capturing redlining in Seattle, and uh, neighborhood and geography have so much to do with population health. David Williams, who's one of the leading scholars in the field of racial discrimination and its health consequences, uh, once said, if you could eliminate residential se segregation in America, 
you would completely erase black white differences in income, education and unemployment and reduce single motherhood by two thirds. All of that is driven by the opportunities linked to geographic space. That is the power of racism. The most powerful mechanism of this is that is the most powerful mechanism is that it is one that no one sees. Um, a couple of other things that I'll draw attention to. Carol Anderson is um, an African American historian at Emory, and she's written an excellent book called One Person, No Vote that's gotten a lot of attention recently. She talks about the way in which voter suppression has been used to disproportionately purge or remove young minority and poor individuals from the voting ballot. Um, she says that the issue of voter ID fraud has been the veiled mechanism for doing that most recently. She offers one statistic of research done by a legal scholar um, from 2000 to 2014, looking at a billion votes cast and only finding 31 incidents of voter ID fraud. So it's actually very much a socially constructed fear that's then used to justify discriminatory policies that disproportionately affect people of color and keep them from voting. So really complicated, eloquent argument that she weaves, really important one to know. Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow is also one that people have heard about. In particular, she uh, talks about how uh, the number of people uh, under the control of the criminal justice, the number of black people under the control of the criminal justice system today, either in prison, or in jail, or on probation, or parole, is actually more than were enslaved in 1850. And the resulting discrimination that individuals face in housing, education, and the vote um, serves to further perpetuate these inequities. So we're gonna watch a brief video from the Equal Justice Initiative that strives to bring all of these concepts together in a slightly more coherent way, and then we'll start to transition to the legacy of slavery and medicine and psychiatry. Turn you uh, talking at all during the yeah. video. Okay. Okay. In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant, but as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, we descended into slavery. The institution of American slavery developed as a permanent, hereditary system centrally tied to race. Millions of black people were forcibly taken from Africa, crammed on ships and brought to the Americas through a dangerous and deadly journey that crossed the Atlantic. Millions died. Once on our shores, slavery deprived the enslaved person of any legal rights or autonomy and granted the slave owner complete power over the black men, women, and children legally recognized as property. An ideology of white supremacy, a narrative of racial difference was created to rationalize and justify the continuation of slavery. American slavery was often brutal, barbaric, and violent. In addition to the hardship of forced labor, enslaved people were maimed or killed by slave owners as punishment for working too slowly, visiting a spouse living on another plantation, or even learning to read. 
enslaved people were also sexually exploited. The United States Congress finally banned the importation of slaves from Africa in 1808. Slavery was widely considered a gross human rights violation, yet enslavement was retained and persisted. The 1808 Declaration caused the demand for slave labor to skyrocket in the Lower South, and the domestic slave trade grew to meet this demand. Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to more than 435,000. Slave traders chained African Americans together in couples and forced them to march hundreds of miles from the Upper South to the Lower South. Steamboats carried slaves along the Alabama River. Rail routes constructed with slave labor brought hundreds of enslaved people to Montgomery, Alabama every day turning the city into one of the largest slave trading communities in the United States. Enslaved people would be paraded up Commerce Street to slave warehouses and slave depots. The city's slave market was at the Artesian Basin, now known as Court Square. Enslaved people of all ages were auctioned along with livestock, standing in line to be inspected. Public posters advertising the sale of slaves included gender, age, skill, complexion, owner's name, and price. Slavery in America traumatized and devastated millions of people. Husbands and wives, parents and children could not protect themselves from being sold away from each other. Enslaved families were separated at an owner's or auctioner's whim, never to see each other again. The domestic slave trade separated nearly half of all enslaved people from their spouses and parents. In 1833, the Alabama legislature banned free black people from residing in the state, meaning that enslavement was the only legally authorized status for African Americans. Even as the Civil War raged, slave trading in Montgomery flourished well into the mid-1860s. After the Confederacy's surrender in 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery nationwide except as a punishment for crime. But in many former slave states, slavery did not end. It simply evolved. Southern whites, angry after losing the war, targeted black people who were largely abandoned by the federal government in the 1870s. For decades, black men, women, and children were tortured, terrorized, and killed by mobs and violent lynchings, oppressed by a system of racist laws and customs. For another 100 years, black people were racially segregated, denied the right to vote, education, and basic dignity. They were humiliated, beaten, or killed for minor offenses or for protesting. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s helped to end legally authorized racial segregation, but racial bias still persists. Today, a presumption of guilt is assigned to many people of color who are disproportionately arrested, convicted of crimes, and sent to prison. African Americans are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison for the same crime as a white person. One in three black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. Police violence against black people is so epidemic that civil rights demonstrations have shut down cities across the U.S. as thousands of people march to protest police brutality. Many states celebrate the era of slavery with Confederate holidays and by honoring the defenders and architects of slavery while ignoring the history of enslavement. The Equal Justice Initiative believes that racial bias remains a serious problem and is a direct and lasting legacy of American slavery and our failure to deal with the history of racial injustice. The Equal Justice Initiative seeks to foster an honest conversation about the legacy of slavery, about mass incarceration, and racial inequality and how it still affects millions of people today. We can confront and overcome bias and discrimination. Please join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. slavery in America as we now transition to slavery in our profession. But this video brings together so many of the most vitally important concepts and ideas and patterns for thinking about the legacy of slavery in medicine and psychiatry. The other piece is that the Equal Justice Initiative um, as an advocacy group has done so much work to advance racial equity 
and even in this video provides some template for thinking about what the next steps are, including fostering a dialogue and really understanding the history. Thank you. There's so many really good podcasts out there right now, and I just want to draw your attention to one through Slate Academy, The History of American Slavery, and then the next series is Reconstruction. The Southern Poverty Law Center has a website packed with free materials. It's on teachingtolerance.org. Oh, sure. And then the other threads captured in the video that'll be pertinent for the next section is the ideology of racial difference emerging as emerging with slavery, the massive human rights violations and government sanctioned violence and terrorism, and then the silence and the denial and the lack of atonement. I'll keep this really brief, but stamped from the beginning is a brilliant piece of work. Um, Dr. Ibram Kendi, uh, on par with Ta-Nehisi Coates, one of the leading scholars in this field, has formed an anti-racist center, I believe it's at George Washington University. His main contention is that racist ideologies have been constructed to justify racist policies. It's not the other way around. Um, so this idea of racial ideology being manufactured to justify policy, it's particularly important for this first part of looking at the legacy of slavery in our profession. So we'll start with ideology and then move on to scientific experimentation, professional exclusion, and then silence. My hope is that each of these threads that I'm trying to trace will layer upon one another and become a bit more nuanced as we move forward. They're all quite interrelated. So first point is that race is a social construct, not a biological one. Um, the Human Genome Project really eliminated the idea of race as being genetic differences, biological fiction. Um, so it is a social construct. But throughout the profession, there has been a narrative of race, racial uh, difference that has evolved. So two of, or a couple of the most blatant examples are listed here. Dr. Samuel Cartwright was, we'll start with Dr. Samuel Cartwright first, um, move on to Dr. James Woods Babcock, and then we'll finish with the father of American psychiatry, Benjamin Rush. Dr. Cartwright was a prominent Louisiana physician and prominent intellectual. He coined the term drapedomania, which is defined as the uncontrollable urge to escape slavery and run away. Um, the treatment for drapedomania was um, whipping, the other illness that he identified was uh, dysesthesia atopica, it even sounds scientific, um, also known as rascality. Again, I, I recognize these, these terms are very problematic to say the least. Um, one of the treatments for that um, involved uh, washing the patient well with warm water, bathing the patient in oil, and then um, slapping the oil on the skin with a broad leather strap. So, in some ways, the, these examples, they sound absolutely ridiculous, but it, it, it's where we start and then the thread starts to develop. Um, there are so many instances in which psychiatry was used to validate slavery. So the 1840 census before the Civil War claimed that um, enslaved people were actually free of mental illness. There was none whatsoever, suggesting that enslavement was actually the default state of existence and being. And then in fact, after emancipation in 1895, James Woods Babcock, a psychiatrist and former superintendent of the South Carolina State Lunatic Asylum, uh, published a, a paper describing the rapid increase in insanity of the Negro and the constant accumulation of black lunatics. Um, and he attributed that to emancipation. So you see the way in which um, one can imagine that people are enslaved and have been stripped of all liberties and freedoms and are enduring torture to run away or refuse to work is 
what is healthy, adaptive, it would be a normal human response, but you see the way in which it is reconfigured as being pathological. Oops. Um, with Benjamin Rush, um, it's a little bit more complicated because um, he was an abolitionist. Uh, so he was an abolitionist who believes that black people suffered from a form of lep leprosy called negritude that would only be cured by becoming white. Um, historian Christopher Willoughby, whose work I'll talk about in the next slide, has described how his teaching was actually presented at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the first medical schools in the country. He also talks about how during a yellow fever outbreak in 1793 that Dr. Rush participates in containing and treating, he posted an ad in, in a Philadelphia newspaper advertising that black people are actually immune to it because they were thought to be physically stronger. He was trying to enlist black nurses to help fight the epidemic and actually a number of them died and a total of a total of 5,000 people died in the epidemic. So this is not just historical relic or benign. <coughs> Medical schools serve as a breeding ground for constructing racist ideology and advancing a narrative of racial difference. So Dr. Willoughby, Willoughby describes how schools manage to do this. One should keep in mind that this is the era of grave robbing in which, uh, in which black cadavers are stolen from cemeteries and used for dissection in medical school. This is a practice that continued for a very long time and one not often talked about. Um, another pedagogy used in northern or in northern medical schools and southern medical schools was related to detecting whether or not a, an enslaved person was lying about illness. So he discusses the teaching of one particular professor who advocated for digging a very deep grave and if people enslaved people complained of having a fever to threaten to bury them alive and in that way you would be able to identify which person was telling the truth and which person wasn't. So I recognize that conceptually this might be a bit of a stretch but this sounds a little bit about a little bit like malingering and trying to figure out who's malingering when they come into service and that's sort of a historical framework that you would not usually talk about in most settings um, in our profession. So there's a way in which medical institutions are promoting a form of toxic whiteness. Um, as the profession is evolving, dominated by white men, and then we can start, start to ask ourselves, what are the ways in which this endures? So during the 18th and 19th century, the narrative of racial difference that's not just in medicine, um, but is in science and shaping a lot of policies and ideologies is scientific racism. The idea that different racial and ethnic groups are descended from different lineages captured in the term polygenism. The idea that some races are more superior and sophisticated while others are more inferior and animal-like. The image on the right captures some of the measurements in the skull craniotomy um, that was used to justify this idea. So this really captures the way in which science is not value or judgment neutral, even though we like to talk about it as being this absolute truth and uh, social aspects of medicine being more fuzzy and less valid. So science is very, very value laid and actually the social sciences do a much better job of dissecting that than we do. This is a really graphic image. It's, um, it's toxic racist content, but I do think it's important to show. It's actually a photo of medical students with a cadaver taken in 1902, and there's, um, to put it mildly, a racial slur at the bottom. Um, I also included an image of a, pan a, a pamphlet on the right using the same um, racial ter racist terms just to capture um, the parallel in a medical setting. So Dr. Willoughby, who has you know, written about this racist pedagogy in medical schools evolving during this time, he commented, quote, this, the racist photos remind us of the social component of education. Students took these photos and made these racist jokes as mementos of the friendships and mastery over cadavers that they cultivate, cultivated together in medical school. So you can start to think about the, um, the Ralph Northam incident and sort of this hidden or not so hidden curriculum that we have in our training. 
Uh, so again, um, a really violent image, but what I want to draw attention to is the way in which there's this ideology of black inferiority, even as in, even as in the larger context of the country, so much brutal, horrific violence is being perpetrated against black people. So the, the ideology uh, becomes even more bizarre and concerning in that sense. Um, so this is a quote from Carol Anderson, who wrote the book on voter suppression, talking about the ways in which violence was used to maintain racial order and to prevent people from voting um, and actively participating in democratic life. The practice of convict leasing um, speaks to the Equal Justice Initiative hashtag of hashtag slavery involved. So after slavery ended, uh, prisons and jails could lease people who are prisoners from predominantly black to do work. There's actually um, a, a grave that was dug up in Sugarland with 98 bodies, unnamed, unmarked bodies of such people. It, it, this happened in the past few months. They were actually constructing the school and found this. And then the Equal Justice Initiative has an image of the children who are also part of this practice um, into the 1940s. So a lot of people, I think, have heard of the, the book, The Protest Psychosis. This is sort of jumping into the 1960s. And, you know, great book by Jonathan Metzl. And what he basically does is he uses hospital records from Ionia State Hospital in Michigan, and he describes how the demographics of schizophrenia change and how that lines up with the social political context at the time. He basically argues that schizophrenia goes from being a disease of somewhat higher functioning, often white people, neurotic, to becoming an illness of violent, um, socially protesting black men caught up in the civil rights movement. And the term the protest psychosis is actually taken from an archives of general psychiatry article from 1968, talking about this phenomenon or illness category of a racial, uh, of a protest psychosis forming in black men. So you start to think back to uh, what uh, Benjamin Rush, Samuel Cartwright and others were saying, and it, it doesn't seem so much like a historical relic when we start to see the continuity. The ad on the left is about an antipsychotic taken from a psych psychiatric journal in the 1970s, clearly portraying an image of a black man uh, reinforcing an ideology of black criminality and violence and aggression, even as the social political reality of the time is one of being um, assaulted, attacked, and murdered. <coughs> So, you know, I come back to these images of Emmett Till, Trayvon, Martyr, uh, Tra Trayvon Martin, and Khalif Browder, because we think about this ideology of criminality um, and deviance among Black men and boys, and there isn't a way in which there's a consideration of all the violence, and violence that's uh, perpetrated against them. And I think this will become more prominent when we talk about the silence in our profession, but there isn't an imperative or at least a national organizational imperative to advocate and protect and speak out on behalf of these things. Um, Khalif Browder's story is tragic. It's captured in a Netflix documentary, documentary series produced by Jay-Z. Um, to sum up his life, he was sentenced to Rikers prison after being accused of stealing a backpack, um, which he stated he did not do. He was in solitary confinement for two out of the three years after he got out, despite enrolling in college and getting mental health treatment, he eventually committed suicide and his life is captured um, quite remarkably in that Netflix series and in these New Yorker articles. So critical race theorist, theorist and lawyer Kimberly Crenshaw drawing attention to the fact that behavior um, behavior by black girls and black boys that would be value black girls and black bo boys that would be um, punished uh, or taken as an affront to authority or it's the same kind of thing that's valued in white white boys in particular um, so just to emphasize that this is not just something that is affecting black boys but also black girls um, Kimberly Crenshaw's group put out the black Girls Matter pushed out, over policed, and underprotected, looking at the disproportionate ways in which 
black girls are punished and suspended and expelled from school. And then Girlhood Interrupted is from a group at Georgetown looking at the adultification of black girls. So the ways in which adults see black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers and less in need of nurturing and protection. So these ideologies and policies are incredibly impactful. And yet it's not something that often um, enters into our medical training. There are so many contemporary correlates that we could go into here. Um, some to think about are diagnosis, use of forceful clinical practices and procedures, um, some of which we were talking about yesterday, Martine. Um, the lack of training um, that we receive, the lack of advocacy on the part of our organizations to speak on behalf of this. Um, the paper on the right, I, I often suffer from putting too much material into things, but the topic is just so important. It's really hard to figure out what stays and what goes. But it's a recent paper ca that came out suggesting that contacts between um, between law enforcement and black and Latino boys can affect their behavior much later on down the road, um, leading to more violence and further police contacts. So there's a way in which you can start to see how damaging um, these practices are for health and well-being, um, but also how effective they are in reinforcing racial order by perpetuating more contacts with the criminal justice system. The fenfluramine study, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because it is rather controversial. What I will say is that it was a study um, in um, in the 90s done at Columbia looking at um, biomarkers for violence in young boys ages 6 to 10. All of these boys, they were identified through the Department of Probation. They had some siblings who were in the criminal justice system and presumably at higher risk for violence. They were given fenfluramine, which was a banned diet drug. Um, it was banned because it was known to have significant cardiac side effects. So the New York Times has written about this. There's an ethics article written about this. There's not as much in our scientific literature about the fallout from this, but um, whether or not it reflects a legacy of slavery, I don't, I, that is not what I'm suggesting. What I would say is, is there a way in which our historical understanding should or does shape our understanding of this study and what happened? Medical experimentation. Do people know the story of J. Marion Sims? Okay, so usually when we talk about medical experimentation, it's often about Tuskegee. Um, and Tuskegee is an incredibly important uh, thing to know about, but there's a way in which other, uh, other examples, the multitude of other examples of scientific experimentation on black people is not talked about. So, before I talk about J. Marion Sims, I will talk about this woman named Anarka, and I will acknowledge that I don't even know her last name to provide her with the appropriate honorific to show baseline respect towards her. But her story is that in 1845, at age 17, she has been in labor for several days. Her owner takes her to see Dr. J. Marion Sims. As he's pulling the baby out with forceps, he causes a vesicovaginal fistula to form. These fistulas can form between the vagina and other nearby organs, causing um, secretion of fluids from one compartment to the other, resulting in scarring, infection, or even death. Um, Dr. Sims leases Anarka, who's 17, from her owner and spends the next three or four years experimenting on her over 30 times, her and two other enslaved women and others, not using anesthesia. And he actually he did the experiments on them not using anesthesia, and once he perfected them, he did them on white women using anesthesia. Um, he also he also created the speculum. Um, so he's not a footnote to U.S. medical history. He's actually called the father of American gynecology. Um, and had a museum, or sorry, had a, a statue in Central Park that was taken down in the past year or two. Um, he's captured in these paintings, the one in the 
left corner, top left, is it's a mural of Alabama's great physicians. You can't see the image well, but there is a black woman lying on the bed there. And then of the woman, Betsy, Anarka, and Lucy, who were known to have been subjected to these experiments, and again, to say their names without an honorific and a last name is, um, so there's no, there's no honor, there's nothing to really honor what their experience was and the contributions that they made. He actually used them to help assist the procedures on one another. Um, the only image that we have of them is the image on the lower right corner, which um, was developed by a pharmaceutical company and distributed in the 40s and 50s to different physician offices. Um, so there's so much to be said about this, but you know, thinking about the legacy of slavery and racism in medicine, the ways in which so much is stripped and taken from black bodies without any recognition, um, the assault and violence that's perpetrated against communities of color. Other excellent resources for learning about scientific abuses beyond Tuskegee uh, the Vanessa Gamble article in the middle under the shadow of Tuskegee is a great pithy read. It's only a couple of pages long and she does a really good job with it. Um, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington <laughs> is another one. Um, Harriet Washington's book goes a lot into the sexual nature of the medical exploitation and experimentation on black women in particular. Um, I don't know if people know that uh, involuntary sterilization was another aspect of the violence perpetrated against women of color. Fannie Lou Hamer was a civil rights activist who called these involuntary sterilizations Mississippi appendectomies. You go in for a flu and you get a Mississippi appendectomy. She herself experienced one. Historians have estimated that tens of thousands even of women um, went through this. <coughs> And this is another great article taking a look at um, sexual and reproductive health and racism from a historical perspective that sort of traces the different examples of it from the time of slavery onwards. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward a little bit just in the interest of time. So the contemporary correlates that I wanna draw attention to that pertain to this leg legacy of scientific experimentation, and in particular to the J. Marion Sims, um, the J. Marion Sims component are that medical students still believe that black people and white people are different, that they experience pain differently, and pain management is an example of one of the disparities where black children and adults are given poorer and less pain management still today. Um, there's also a legacy of disproportionately targeting communities of color for long-term or, ir or irreversible contraceptive practices. And we have the disparity that I mentioned at the beginning of African-American maternal mortality without thinking about this legacy. <coughs> Professional exclusion. So there is a crisis of black male physicians in this country. The National Academy of Medicine has essentially said that the number of black male medical students has not improved in the past 40 years. And it follows on a legacy of professional exclusion that started centuries ago, most prominently when medical schools did not have black medical students. But then even after black medical schools were created in the 19th century. So the Flexner Report is sort of the centerpiece that I would draw attention to with all but two of seven black medical schools being closed in, in 1910 with no consideration of how the black community would be served without those physicians. The image on the left is from an article referring to the Brigham Hospital in Boston, taking down a number of portraits, 31 portraits of medical luminaries, all men, 30 out of 31 white, um, to put the focus on diversity. But does taking down photos address the issue um, when we think about the crisis of black male physicians? So some of the correlates here are just how 
few the numbers are of underrepresented minority physicians, only 5% of doctors and 30% of the population. And if we think about the halls of power being the fora for racism, then we have to take a look at academic tenure and promotion and how that lines up racially as well. So I am running over time, so I'm gonna move things along. My hope is that in starting to talk about some of these issues, it becomes clearer how much a lot, how much this content is not woven into our clinical care or our clinical training. And in that way, the silence becomes even more palpable. Um, so going back to the Ralph Northam incident, hopefully now thinking about this yearbook incident, the fact that he did not step down, and also the fact that none of the medical organizations, to my knowledge, spoke out about it, about the legacy of slavery, about the racism and how it would affect um, patient communities of all backgrounds. Um, hopefully that legacy has become, is clearer to see now. And it takes place at a time when top journals are acknowledging how discriminatory behaviors and discrimination shape health and health outcomes and are calling on us to do better. So the science is telling us that we need to do more and yet somehow we're not doing it. I also like to show that for ACAP, if you look at the practice parameters um, and the policy statements from recent years, which is just one small metric of what we're advocating for and what we're thinking about, there's really nothing or very little that's related to race and racial discrimination. Whereas the American Psychological Association, I know this is hard to see, they actually have a flurry of different statements, which is not to say that that's the end all be all, but by comparison, they're saying a lot more. So what do we do differently? So Ibram Kendi will say a racist or an anti-racist is not who we are, but what we are doing in the moment. And he's actually writing a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist um, that hasn't come out yet, um, but will be incorporated into this once he does. And he has a great series in The Guardian trying to imagine what an anti-racist America would look like. One of the first things that he recommends is understanding what racism is and learning the ideologies and the policies. We don't have to rewrite this book. We actually have tremendous inspiration already um, about what anti-racist health activism would look like. Um, Alondra Nelson, uh, a, physician, a physician historian, has written about um, anti-racist advocacy, talking about how Black Lives Matter is actually not new anti-racist activism, but follows on a very impressive arc of anti-racist activity um, in the form of the Black Panther Party, Fannie Lou Hamer, and others. I also want to close with this racial justice report card, which was developed by medical students, the medical student wing of White Coats for Black Lives, and it provides sort of a template for thinking about what are some of the things that we can do differently. And again, this is widely available online. It's a great reference to look at to start to think about what comes next. So we will close with the inspired words of James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So hopefully this uh, attempt at a deep dive looking at slavery in our country and also its legacy in our profession gives some sense of what some anti-racist next steps might look for and help us imagine what it would be like to create a more just healthcare system. And then I'll close with the artwork of Kara Walker, um, whose powerful artistry shows us, I think it says a lot about what looking at our history involves. It involves taking an image that initially looks quite beautiful, but as we start to look at it more closely, it actually reveals horrifying truths that we have to sit with um, in order to make sense of what it's showing us. So I hope you all leave today not feeling uh, entirely discouraged, but hopeful that there is a knowledge to be had, there are things to think about, and at least having a couple of things to do or conversations to have when you leave here to keep this going. Thank you.
Um, will we be able to get emails uh, to all these things? I, I hope so, and I made the slides that way so that it can be distributed so people could see. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll make sure that they get shared. Yes. Um, is it at all useful strategy to talk about pathology in the white community in terms of the, um, the denial yes. of wedding just plain? But I don't know if it's useful um, or strategic to talk about that within the context of uh, mental health or mental illness. Uh, but it certainly affects all of you. Um, I certainly hate when, um, you know, um, I think there was the name of the man who walked into the church and shot and killed um, um, uh, how many black uh, uh, church members. And folks start talking about, well, maybe there's a psychiatric disorder there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a, what do you think about that? So I think it's really hard to take one hour on one topic. It, it, so I, you know, this is always, and it's it's painful. There's never a time that I walk in feeling like I know exactly what I'm going to say because there's no way to do it. Um, so I will say that um, in one of the lectures that I created right after this lecture, I talk about white fragility and sort of um, allow Robin D'Angelo to do the eloquent discussion of this denial because I think coming from her, it's so powerful, it's so well said. And she sort of takes all of these ideologies and defenses and lays them out in a way and then also gives a template for what to do differently. So my sense is that it is helpful to do that. And my own personal experience is getting up there and talking about white fragility and it's hard to do, but she provides the words and the language to do it. And so in that sense, it's coming from her as a white woman, and it does feel effective. Thank you for your talk. Oh, that was a really I wish we had more time to talk about it, that the discussion is really important too, because when people walk out the door without it, that can be really hard as well, but. Our, our one hour, the short time frame, but I don't know, do we have the room for a little longer? Is it yeah, until so 1 1.30, 30. yeah. Thank you all for staying for this long. I really appreciate it. I'm so sorry that I need to go because there's much more important than what I need to do next. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Does anything, excuse me, does anything come to mind? Is, thing or two that we should be thinking of as like academic psychiatrists or residency program or working with my students, like something to avoid, like a misstep to avoid or something to move towards. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the thing that was coming up is, I, I wish Martina had been able to stay longer because she was talking, I met yesterday with her and some other folks from the medical school, and she was talking about her research looking at the use of restraint and seclusion and how it's her data has shown, or their data has shown that's disproportionately used against black people and that they've tried to do some work working on this. So I, I think thinking of that, looking at this, we can see ways in which coercive behavior is used to maintain racial order. I, I think we can start to see that across education, housing, policing, medicine. So if coercive behavior is used to maintain racial order. How are we doing that? Um, and then, you know, this is a tough topic to tackle, but we have so many opportunities to be coercive with people, with our holds, with our injections, with our restraints. How do we then start to factor this into the decision making that we have? And as a next step, developing a racial consciousness to even think about it in the first place. We don't have to have the solution quite yet, although I don't think it's that far away, but even thinking about it as being vitally important. So we know about trauma, you know, we know about the epigenetics of trauma being passed on. 
to harm people further who are traumatized or, or have had generations of trauma. We know that we cannot do that. That's harmful to people. So I think taking that literature and thinking about it from a racial perspective in the clinical encounter is really important. And my sense just from spending a little bit of time here is that it's sort of like the trainees and, and students want to talk about it, but are afraid to bring it up, especially in supervision encounters. And the, the answer does not have to be, we don't have to have a clean answer. There isn't one, but at least are we bringing it up and saying, hey, I am seeing XYZ clinician and XYZ patient. I think something is happening here. Can we talk about it? I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, one of the, I think that's a very important point in terms of, of how we as professionals deal with the clinical encounter and what happens moment by moment when we confront somebody who's different. And a whole medical system, I think, is really geared to minimizing the importance of that encounter. We're taught to treat illness. This whole idea, I said to somebody earlier, if I hear the term behavioral health, I must grow up. Um, because we're treating individual people who all come from a history of other individual people, but in a social context. And unless we're able to get some idea of who we're treating, our diagnostic criteria are not what they were the, the, or the you know, electronic crap. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an analyst. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I'm an analyst. But um, I've been. Right now, I'm involved and I'm going from here to, to, to teach a five part course on diversity and differences in psychoanalytic degree. And I, mean, I try to figure what can we do with seven and a half hours on this topic. And what I really try to focus on is having the first year psychoanalytic candidates have an experience of having to think about their own experience of race, gender, sexual preference, ability, disability, immigration. And where they have had blind spots, challenges, what they don't know, and at a time when hopefully this can be worked on in their own analysis and in their own long term case supervision. Um, the benefit of, of a psychoanalytic or psychoanalytic encounter is you've got some time to get to know people. But the limitation of your typical psychiatric clinic encounter is you don't. And so you're, you're basing the diagnosis <coughs> on a whole lot of untransparent assumptions about people who don't know. And, it, and the question is how to, how to begin to undo some, excuse me, how to begin to undo some of that in our formative education program, meaning in the doctor. Hearing you say that also reminds you that I think in a, as a caregiving a profession, we often think about the ways in which we're going to help, and we don't stop and first say, how are we going to avoid doing harm? I, I think that's always where I, I think from a racial equity or any equity perspective, with a legacy like this, one always has to first think, how do I not do more harm with every action I take? I, I actually think when you were mentioning Martine's work, that's a very interesting example, because one can imagine doing something where you're, you know, whether this is, you know, data from a study, but actually being able to present to trainees, look, these are the kinds of statements that were used in interactions that didn't lead to yes. history, yes. didn't lead to something more aggressive. So we are, we're aware that this happens, but let's notice how, what makes these reactions different, right? What is it about the, actually doing case studies on this, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to say, hmm, how did that, what was that process that led to that and what are the alternatives? How can I learn the alternatives? And as you were saying, you reminded, hmm, what am I reacting to as I'm making this decision? Yeah, I think that's the only one thing I struggle with is when we perpetuate, I'm part of a system that perpetuates a lot of violence and trauma on people in a lot of different, it's in a lot of different ways, and like that comes through in so many patients. Encounters. Like when I'm talking to a patient about, I'd like you to come into the hospital, like, heck no, like, you know what they did to me last time. You know, like that, mm -hmm. it, it goes that, like, it's, it's such a hard thing to know how to 
how to, how to be honest about um, with patients that I'm not part of that system, I'm not part of that, that history, right? Like that, that piece, all the pieces of it. So. And also you're embedded in larger structures and institutions and organizations. Yeah. and. And so you are having this individual encounter. There's a lot that can be leveraged, and yet you are embedded in these socio-ecological levels of existence where racism operates in different ways. So trying to figure out what's safe and therapeutic, it, it becomes even more complicated. And yet I think there's a way to do it. I do think there is a way to do it. Um, but I, I, I hear what you're saying about having this dilemma and then not feeling like there's really a template for us to think about what we do as doctors to manage and treat it. Right, for the situation. Thank you. Thanks. Really appreciate your um, presentation. Thank you so much for the time. Um, I think one of the ways to really help the situation is working proactively on diversity. Um, I'm a medical graduate from Cuba and program that graduated more African Americans, all of the medical US. So, so I'm definitely a witness to that success. But coming back to our country, um, it's difficult to re-enter the medical system. A lot of barriers. And I think it's sort of a product of this system that comes from, from slavery. It's hard for us to go to our communities you know, where, where there's a, a need for people lack of I think people really just be, need to be more proactive about it. And when they're on probation, there were many African American doctors who were coming in from all around the state mm -hmm. um, to go to residents and residences of the church. Right. You know, they were foreign medical graduates, not African American. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting in terms of our displacement of African American men in particular. Mm -hmm. Right, and the critiques are, you know, people will talk about enhancing the pipeline or having more people, but people don't talk about changing the professions or changing the barriers that are in place so that this, this changes. Throw out, it's not aware of an organization called Black Society for Americans. Mm -hmm. Just put it on your radar, mm -hmm. and if you ever have a chance to go to one of their meetings, <laughs> yes, I I went a couple of years ago when Jonathan Metzl spoke. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. That was interesting to do the group of blacks at November eighth or whatever it was. I was a, I actually there this weekend there was a meeting to here in Seattle. About how to launch the African American Health Board with a lot of people from different domains um, in health that were present. But someone that pulled me aside because mental health is actually one of the priorities for us. But someone pulled me aside and said, You know, tell me about this trauma informed care. I feel like I feel like it's such an insulting thing to approach someone by saying, What happens to you or what's and when, when in fact you're the thing that happened to you. It's just that you know, you have a system that happened to someone, but yet you're asking them what's wrong with them because of you know, what are the adversities they've experienced without without that, without being able to take into consideration the larger context. So she said, So I have a problem with your profession. And I thought, you know, this is the kind of thing that one needs to be careful about how we how we talk about trauma and uh, how we look at the responsibility for. Um, else to add to our yeah, and for, first, do no harm. I mean, not to, but it, it, the, from this perspective and what you're saying, the, the first step is really not to harm and hurt people further and to question whether or not they should even engage with the mental health system, whether the benefits outweigh the risk. That's probably a moving target, also. One of the real, really difficult things in psychiatry. Is when there is a convergence of experience of depression, discrimination, et cetera, and trauma, um, the, the sort of kind of reaction that's 
Test 10, which becomes a kind of template for engaging the rest of the world, which can also lead to, in some instances, personality disorder challenges. I mean, when you're trying to face somebody who is experiencing discrimination, but also recognizing the ways in which their template for dealing with the world, you begin to kind of draw down some of the things that they can do. And that, I think, is a real, real challenge for a lot of, uh, of clinicians. Is how, do you, how do you stick with that without uh, trying to help somebody see that it's bad, but it doesn't have to be that bad. <laughs> or yes, there's a battle to be fought, but the way you're approaching it isn't going to get you what you want. It's actually going to be a little bit more like quicksand. And how do you do that without seeming not to understand? Or seeming racist yourself, yeah. right? Particularly when you're the same race again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> But also, I think for people that are working with them, whether whatever your ethnicity that you're working with, someone who is the same, how many assumptions are you making that, well, because of the same similarity, you're having some questions of your own understanding and you can manage it? It becomes interesting in, in the race and the transference and how you describe how people are presumably of the same race and share the same experience and the same example. It's really kind of trivial, but um, the American Psychiatric Association has the first African American president, and um, and there was a party for the first African American president the first day of the after party uh, upstairs, which was attended by black people, <laughs> and um, for various reasons it was banned, and, and I tried to drum some of that, and another African American psychiatrist, and we really tried to rehearse the song. <laughs> And we began to realize it was a gospel song that we didn't have all those the same church. <laughs> and getting all of that <laughs> rhythm together was not going to happen. So we had to do something else. And, you know, it was kind of like, and how often does that happen? <laughs> but we have a commonality of understanding all of our history. But experience it differently and different ways of coping with it and then trying to bring that together. And then, you know, the assumption that you make is that somebody who is of a different race or culture wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to, to actually have some idea of what you're experiencing in a kind of lived way. This is interesting. Um, I don't want to dominate the discussion, but one of the things I did back when I was a chief resident uh, years ago here um, was to have all of the residents in one of the didactic meetings down and have and have done this with all the residents. Look at the person across the table from you. You don't know them very well. Try to imagine the backstory of the background of that person. And then you know, you could talk about their experiences. And you'd be surprised how often the things about you that they share with us just what they kind of culture the way that they would surprise you. But here are two ideas. Thank you for coming. I, I have an ill-formed question. So, uh, something that I thought about uh, with some of the statistics and also with the about the difference between medical uh, school. I feel like sometimes it's hard to tease out class that you know, like during some of the slides that we're saying like, well, we're not having enough black medical school graduates, for example, I don't know what the other ones that I'm saying. Yeah, and that's definitely coming from a systematic 
systemic racism problem and lots of stuff, but it's also because part of the result of the systemic racism is class supremacy. Mm -hmm. There isn't there isn't a population to draw from as much African American. You know what I'm saying? Like, you are you asking like what? How much of it is socioeconomic versus right. race? And the socioeconomic part, uh, you know, is resulting in like the racist system. But I think I, I guess sometimes I feel like that's a confounder that weakens the argument about race sometimes. Yeah, so like a lot of racial scholars will actually identify the consideration of socioeconomics as functioning sometimes as a defense against looking at the racism. Now whether or not it is always race or is it socioeconomics? I think that depends on the issue. So in the racial discrimination literature or in the health disparities literature, there's so many of these things that maintain even when controlling for socioeconomics. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the, the woman that I was showing, I can get you her name. There was a slide that I had about African-American maternal mortality. And then there was a woman and I included all of her degrees in it. She's actually a CDC re researcher who was researching health disparities and died in childbirth after repeatedly going to the doctor. So that's a little bit separate from what we were talking about with medical school and everything else. But right, just that would be that would be another one. Yes, and then also, um, so one of the many challenges of this topic for myself personally is there's so many surrounding enriching literatures, and then figuring out where they overlap and what. But you know, there is a literature about the experience of being a black trainee and black physician in this country or a physician of color. Um, it's not well developed, it's not evolved, and you can't capture it all in surveys. Um, but we know that that experience is, um, people talk about healthcare as being a space of structural violence, um, so is clinical training in this country. So I don't know if that answers or. I just point out a, a structural assumption Um, you know, there's, if you go to some big candy things and talk to some black residents or whatever, you discover that there's a great deal of, of difference in terms of the path that people took to get medical school. And, um, you know, it, it's like looking at football players in the NBA and thinking that they're all rich uh, and, and trying to figure out where did they come from? Where did they go home to be? And, uh, or there are certainly you know, African American residents who come from generations of doctors and are, you know, and are affluent. There are some people where they're the first person in their family to ever even go graduate high school and somehow get to medical school. And their experience is really very different. And, and so I say, I, I applaud reading all that stuff, but actually talking to the residents would be a good thing to do to get to know them. I think also the the some of the material about structural and institutional racism. So no matter where people come from socioeconomically or where we think they come from, there are just so many institutions in which racism lives and shapes our lives and experience, and they all sort of come together. So with housing and redlining and generational wealth and educate, it, there are just so many facets to it that shape an individual experience that one would have to learn or know or think about. I mean, I think that's part of what I really appreciate about your talk, like you touched on this difference, like the scholars that wrote about like uh, segregation in neighborhoods, the fact that not all neighborhoods were white. You put up a slide of the redlining map in Seattle and like from working here, I also only learned through work like of the connection between the Seward and the Belly kind of like immigration center to Seattle. So like you know like the population of all of those variables seem connected, like epigenetics, diagnosis, treatment, mm -hmm. and profession. You know, like when it's like but I, but I, I hope you have that conversation with other because you're are you know you're what you just said is so important, and all of us have to keep on having these conversations. So, to me, that's very powerful what you said and what you're saying. I I hope that, I hope that you're talking or teaching or sharing that with other people too. <laughs> yay! Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
There have been some New York Times series recently about how basically it's all reversing now and white people are moving into the inner city, uh, people of color moving out into the suburbs. And yeah, so there's like another, it's just sort of a part two, uh, 2019 edition of what's happening now. Thank you all for staying. One feels like she got hit by a truck after doing something like this, so it's great to have people to talk to. What would you recommend as like the first book or two yeah, um, you know, I would even just start with an article. Just okay. yeah, but um, I would say that Alondra Nelson article, "Beyond the Shadow of Tuskegee," that's a really good one. Um, I would start with that. Yeah, thanks for coming, for staying. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 I will explain it and then you can look it up on Wikipedia. Okay. But the idea is that residential segregation was a deliberate government policy and the government created maps and let home, like uh, like bank like banks loaning loans. They said you can put black people here, you can put white people here, but you can't do that. So you can give these low interest loans to affluent white people. They can have higher property value, they can have better schools. So is the the drawing out on the maps to reinforce, like to say this is where people of color live, this is where white people live. Yep. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. Don't be embarrassed. Yep. Look at the complete disaster. Okay. I can't tell, guys. Like, it's always really. Oh, God. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Well, without you, you and James would not have Oh, my gosh. Oh, without you. Oh, my God. No, you did. That's why. Right.